softball fields. You know what you do when you got a nice new car? I parked it way out beyond center field, about the third row back, as far as you can get it, so that none of those long ball hitters would ever reach it, right? Well, as luck would have it, one of the teams had a pregame batting practice, and they had it about two-thirds of the way down the left field line. And well, you know where the story is going, don't you? One of their long ball hitters managed to get a hold of one, and that ball just sailed through the air, right out the parking lot. You know where it landed? Smack dab in the middle of the hood of my brand new car. Right? I mean, they, they, they couldn't have measured it any better. It was like perfect, right in the middle, from side to side, from front to back. Right there in the middle of my hood was this, this big softball sized dent that had a light from the ball right there in it. And then there was this, like, this little chain kind of marking from the laces going through it. So even though my car was a Honda, you might have looked at it and thought, that's a Saturn. Deep sense of disappointment. 
And this disappointment goes so deep for God that finally God says, I'm just sorry, I created you. Now, if that isn't a sobering statement, I don't know what it is. So what's God going to do? God says, well, I think, you know, we'll go back to the drawing board, plan B. God devises this plan B, this, this thing that it kind of gives us sort of a sense of baptism, although it's not really baptism. But God says, I'll get a flood, and I'll just wash it, or I'll wash it clean of all the sin and all the evil that's there. And everything will be fine again. And, and God's doing this out of this, this desire to restore the relationship with God's people that has been broken by, by our sin as human beings. And so God brings the flood. But he said, rather than start from scratch, he, start, he leaves behind these, this couple of people, Noah and his family, and some two animals of every kind in the ark. They managed to survive the flood, right? And then when the flood waters go down, God thinks, we're doing good here. Noah gets off the, off the ark. The first thing he does, he builds an, builds an altar. He offers this, this sacrifice of thanks to God. God's sitting there smelling that sweet smoke of sacrifice in his nostrils, just kind of taking it all in, thinking, this is, this is good. Do you know what happens? While God's smelling that sweet smell of sacrifice, Noah's out planting the vineyard. And out of the vineyard, he comes up with some, some grapes. And of course, out of the grapes, he comes up with some wine. And the next thing you know, Noah's cast out in his tent, dead and drunk. And things keep on going from there. It just gets worse and worse. This, this, this renewal of creation that God intended just never did a work. So this brings us to this, this promise, which in biblical language is a covenant. This is, this is God's first promise to God's people and to creation. And God says, and this is a promise too, like many of God's promises, that has absolutely nothing to do with, with Noah. No responsibility, no response needed from them. God just simply says, I promise that I will never again destroy the earth and all its creatures by a flood. Now that, to me, is grace at its best. Way back in Genesis at the very beginning. What makes this promise even more astounding even more graceful is that God makes this promise to God, knowing full well that that flood didn't change a thing about humanity. Right? Us as God's people, we are, as we say in our confession, in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. There seems to be something about creation that there's this little bit of evil that always is inside of us. This little bit of openness that, that somehow is in there that causes us to, to look at others in funny ways, especially those that aren't like us, to not like them so much, to, to, to respond with hatred and violence and injustice and oppression. And yet, God makes this covenant anyway. Now, there's never been a God like that ever before, and there's none God like that since. But to seal the deal, God puts this bowl in the sky. I know you're thinking, probably, well, at least I'm thinking anyway, what's that bowl got to do with this stuff? I mean, where does that come from? And why is that there? How did that get in the picture? Well, it seems that in primitive societies, when two nations were at war with each other, they came to the end of the war, what they would do, the leaders of, of those two nations, they would take their bows and they would hang them up on the wall as a sign of peace. Because a bow that's hanging on a wall is not being used to, to shoot arrows at each other, right? So what God does with this bow in the sky is kind of like a sign of God saying, I hang, I'm hanging up the bow, I'm not going to fight with people anymore. I'm just going to live with my people in peace. And I'm going to love them and care for them just the way they are. 
This bull is not so much a reminder to us of God's love and grace, although it certainly has that effect. But really, this bull in the sky, I guess kind of the children of the church, is, is a reminder to God of this promise to be faithful, that God will never again destroy or create the world and all of God's creation, never again. So what you see is that God has become committed to, it, to, to the future of a less than perfect world. God has decided to enter in to us in all our imperfections, to live with us. And God doesn't put the burden on us. But God decides that if God's going to find another way, a plan to see, a way of working with this brokenness of creation. That plan C, of course, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came into the world to live with us in the midst of our brokenness, to live with us in the midst of our unfaithfulness, our sinfulness, and yet to show us how to love, what it is to love, and how to love each other and learn to live with each other. So that whatever it is that dwells in our hearts, that keeps us from living in, in the harmony of life that God intended for us, God created the world. The message is that God will never give up on loving us, caring for us, and being with us and seeking to reconcile us to God and to one another. So as we make our way through this season of Advent, and we think about this, this story of the flood, there's a couple things that we probably want to remember. First of all, this promise that, that God had made to Noah and descendants and consequently to us, that God will never destroy the world again through a flood. But also that God's desire for new life overcomes all of our tendencies for evil and violence and hatred and anger. That's a God that we can trust with our fears and our frustrations, our weaknesses and our failures. Now and forever to come. So what I want to do is, I want to invite you to come back next week so that you can hear how God continues to work out this story and this love for God's imperfect people through an elderly couple named Abram and Sarah. Have a trouble, have a child. See you next week.